Can't tell me nothing by life if you don't know pain. How you gonna try to coach if you don't know the game? You gonna get on the field and pick the wrong place. Instead of seeking help, you wanna do your own thing. A little bit is a love in me, love. That's why I'm giving you all of my love, girl. Thought I knew love, but you redefined it. Redefined it. Took me a while, but indeed I found it. Finally found it. Yes, the hood keeping me reminded. Fake love in the past had me blinded. So you, you can't cancel me, cause I don't Wake up my people and wake up You just wanna do what you need Yeah, yeah Cause you're living in the love stuff You just wanna do it Don't steal God is knowledge But fools despise instruction They need a Bible college for wisdom The Holy Spirit instructs me Sucklings need milk They can't digest They can't digest They learn So they misinterpret John 3.16 So uh, the title is In What Manner Will Yahweh Shai Return And What Will Be the Signs That Signify His Coming And I uh, just want to start off by saying Call Allah Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai And just uh, I'm thankful and happy to be, be on the call with my brothers and sisters again Um we're going to go ahead and get into it, and we're going to start with Psalm 50, verses 3 through 5. This is the book of Psalm, chapter 50, starting at verse 3. Our God shall come, and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Con, con. So we see that, you know, it says that our father, our God is going to come. And he's not going to be silent when he comes. It says, a fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. So that fire that shall devour before him is going to come as he comes or in front of him. So we know with our God sending salvation to this earth for his saints, there's going to be destruction also that comes with it. So, uh, brother, if you could grab tempestuous in the Hebrew. usage is to storm, shiver, dread, bristle, with horror, be very afraid, um, to storm away, sweep away, whirl away, um, to sweep away, to storm away of God's action against the wicked, um, to be stormy, be tempestuous, and then jump down to the definition uh, to shiver, i.e. fear, be horribly afraid, fear, hurl as a storm, be tempestuous, come like, take away with a whirlwind. Con, con. So tempestuous, um, the root word of that is tempest. And tempest just means a storm or, you know, some natural occurrence in the weather that's uh, fierce. It's not, you know, just some rain falling and a little bit of wind. It's an actual storm that's a furious storm and a violent storm. So um, when we look at verse 3, it says that 
it shall be very tempestuous around about him. So it's going to be, if you can imagine a, a storm, a bad storm, but with fire. So that's just the same way that Yahweh is going to send his destruction upon this earth. And we know that, you know, he's going to send his son, Yahweh Shai, to be the one who basically gives this earth the things that it will actually experience. It won't be him himself. He'll use his son and his angels. So it says, uh, verse four, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So we know that we have made a covenant with the most high Yahweh by sacrifice, by giving up things that we used to do in our former life. And also by the sacrifice that he gave for his son. He sent his son to die for us. And this was, you know, made available to us so that we could come back in through this grace because we were scattered and we were tricked into worshiping other gods and following other cultures. So this is the provision he made with us according to this covenant. So brother, if you could grab Acts 1 verses 9 through 11. This is Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Yahweh, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Time. So we see that Yahweh was taken up in a cloud. And it says that he's going when he comes back, he's going to come back in the same manner. So with the clouds, Yahweh will come. So we know that, you know, him being received into a cloud, it's just it's not saying that he he just got, you know, uh, beamed up into a cloud. That wouldn't be, you know, something that would actually suffice to be realistic. Just a cloud. It's a cloud. Um, so we're going to get some scriptures to actually show exactly what this scripture is saying about how Yahweh Shai will return and where exactly did Yahweh Shai go when he left earth. So it says, and uh, we'll go to uh, Psalm 68 and 17. For Salaki, uh, go to, yeah, that's that's good. Salaki, my bad. Go ahead. This is the book of Psalm, chapter sixty-eight and verse seventeen. The chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Ah. So we see that there are chariots of God that were at Sinai. And these chariots of God would be the same thing that Yahweh got taken up into when he left earth. So we're going to continue. Um, brother, grab Exodus 19 and verses 11 through 13, because we want to see exactly what went on in Sinai in the holy place. This is the book of Exodus, chapter 19, starting at verse 11. And be ready against the third day. For the third day, Yahweh will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, To heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or to the border of it, Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not in hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Ah, ah. 
and says, and be ready against the third day for the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. So it's a reason that he's actually saying this. He's telling them, hey, don't, don't go up there toward the mountain, because something's going to happen to you. But we're going to read the account to show exactly how he came down upon the mountain. And we'll see exactly why he didn't want them to go near the mountain. Brother Grab, verses 16 through 18. This book of Exodus chapter 19, starting at verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings in the thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Come. So... In verse 18, it says that Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And so we just got through reading in uh, Psalm 50 that when the Lord comes down, there's a fire that goes before him. So this was what happened on Mount Sinai. He came down and his fire went before him. And so that smoke that's ascending as the smoke of a foreign furnace is because of him and his presence coming down upon that mountain. That's why he told them, Hey, don't come near this mountain or you're going to suffer some wrath. So this was why it, why it was wise of them to just take heed to what the Lord had commanded them at that time. So looking at these chariots and knowing that with these chariots fire comes, we're going to continue reading and showing the scriptures that show more detail about what happens when the chariots come down. Brother, grab Isaiah 66, verses 14 through 16. There's a book of Isaiah, chapter 66, starting at verse 14. And when ye see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb. Like an herb, Salakia, and the hand of Yahweh shall be known toward his servants, and his indignation toward his enemies. For behold, Yahweh will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of the fire. For by fire, and by his sword, will Yahweh plead with all flesh. And the slain of Yahweh shall be many. Time. So we see again, it talks about this whirlwind, which is this tempest that comes with Yahweh when he comes or, or also with his angels when he sends those chariots down the same way that it would come when Yahweh returns. So we know that, you know, for us, it's, it's going to be a glorious thing for these things to happen when your house shall returns. But it's going to be some people that's not going to like it. It ain't going to be so pleasant to them because they're going to get burnt with the fire of indignation. So this is something we look forward to. But uh, brother, grab John 14 verses 1 through 3. This is a book of John chapter 14, starting at verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Time. And Yahweh is just showing 
that he died just so we could be received back into this covenant. And he's saying there's many mansions. So, you know, there's many of us Israelites that can be saved, you know, if we want to actually be saved. But we have to have action on our part to partake of these things. So, you know, it says also in verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Ye, ye may be also. We know that when Yahweh Shah left here, he went into the glory of the most high. And it was like he was one with the father. The same way we want to be one with the father and with the son by walking in the ways of the father. So that glory, to have that glory for eternity is something that's, you know, we can't even express the meaning and the feeling of joy that we'll actually have to experience that. Uh, brother, go ahead and grab Matthew 24, verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Ah, so we know that Yahweh don't even know when this is actually going to happen. But it's something we can definitely look forward to. But, you know, there is a way to actually forecast you know, how close we are to it actually happening. And we're going to actually get into that because these signs that's going to signify his return, we're supposed to be on watch for them so we don't get caught off guard. Um, Brother, grab First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. the book of 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 starting at verse 1 but of the times and the seasons brethren ye have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Ah. And so, uh, Brother, grab travail in the Greek. So, the outline of biblical usage is... The pain of childbirth, travail pain, birth pains, intolerable anguish in reference to the dire calamities precede the, the advent of the Messiah. And then the definition, a pang or a throw, especially of childbirth, pain, sorrow, travail. Ah, so um, this being likened to the birth well, a woman uh, in bearing childbirth, you know, it's something that you can actually think about in the sense of like, that's, that's some horrible pain. I've heard people with women say that that's the worst pain they've ever experienced. So this will actually be the worst pain that someone could actually experience when it does happen. And also with um, childbirth or with bearing a child, we know that there's trimesters. So you know that, you know, you got the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, you know you're about to get ready to have the baby. Um, this same same type of characteristic can be likened to the end times and knowing that there's going to be signs to show that the time is here or the time is coming and almost here. So it says, uh, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So this government 
or these governments of this earth. They're going to get to a certain point in time where they're going to think everything is okay. Everything's all good. Just like we know right now, the American dollar is crashing. The economy is crashing. But they're definitely going to do something to try and revive this, this failing economy. They're going to do something. And they're going to think they got to a point where they resolved the problem. But Yahweh said it's not going to be so. But he's going to allow them to think that they've resolved the problem so that they can be caught off guard and think that they have peace and safety. And then that destruction comes upon them. But uh, we're going to continue getting into it a little more and uh, go to Matthew 24 verses 37 through 39. the book of Matthew 24, starting at verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the, the coming of the Son of Man be. Ah, so it's going to be people that's not going to take heed to the warning in the same way how Noah went around warning people and telling them, hey, I'm building the ark because it's about to get real. Yahweh about to have some indignation on this place because y'all don't want to do right. And so, you know, there was warning that just needed to be heeded, which you know, it never changes. The same thing repeats itself with, with nothing new under the sun. So right now we have people warning people and telling them, hey, Yahweh was about to have some vengeance on this place. It's only a matter of time. We don't know exactly what time, but we know from the signs we're seeing in the earth that it ain't going to be a long time. Um, brother, if you could grab First Thessalonians chapter five, verses four through five. It's the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, starting at verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Ah, so we ain't going to get overtaken as a thief. We're going to be able to discern what's going on and be able to see it out. And we're going to be actually happy to see it continue to unfold. See these prophecies unfold. It's going to be a joy to our heart. Because we're going to know it's almost time to leave this place. Because we don't want to be here. We want to see eternal life. Um, Brother Grab, Revelation 6, chapter, verses 14 through 17. Come. You said 14 to 17, correct? Ha. 14 through 17. Ha. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 6, starting at verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face it's of him. Uh, hey, Brother Keith, uh, it's going to be the camera button on the far left. Con, I'll start back from 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Con. Con. So, you know, in verse 15, it says, and the kings of the earth, 
and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. When you think about someone hiding in the rocks of the mountains, um, if, you, if y'all ever heard of bunkers, bunkers are like underground caves that have been built. And a lot of rich people actually have them. And they have it for like doomsday prep. Like if something happens to happen to Armageddon, you know, in their terms, Armageddon and doomsday supernatural events that they think they can run and go hide underground. This scripture is saying that no matter what, nobody's going to be able to hide and get away from the wrath of Yahweh. Verse 16 says, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Just that that verse, you know, them saying fall on us. They want the rocks to fall on them, not literally to fall on them, but that's probably literally what's going to happen. The rocks probably going to fall on them and crush them because Yahweh was not going to let them escape. But they're saying fall on us, basically protect us be over the top of us and make sure we don't get harmed by your power. But, you know, that's just another aspect of the second coming of your power shot. Um, Brother Grab, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. It's the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And starting at 15, correct? Con. 16, Salakim. 16, Con. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Yahweh shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. God. So we see it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And we, we just read scriptures. And I know one scripture in particular talked about him not coming in silence. So this is him coming down with a shout. So simultaneously with this happening, it says, with the voice of the arch archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So we got the ones that died obeying and ser- following Yahweh shine, serving Yahweh, who's going to rise first. Then it says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So these things are going to happen simultaneously together at the same time it won't be you know that like uh you know they teach that you die you go to heaven or hell Nah, the dead is going to get risen right before that before your comes back or as he as he comes back with the last trump so this is just showing that this is part of what we look forward to in the end but there are things that that are going to happen before that that will show us that we're getting close to this time. So we're going to get into those things. Brother, uh, grab Matthew 24, and we're going to start with verse, verses 6 through 8. It's the book of Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Ah. So verse eight says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So this is giving us a timeline. We know that the beginning of sorrows will be us hearing of wars and rumors of wars. It says for all these things are going to pass, but the end is not yet. So we've definitely seen wars and we've heard rumors of wars. And that's been going on 
for decades. Um, it says, and ye, it says, for nation shall rise against nation. And when we look at nation rising against nation, that's not saying Europe against uh, America. That's saying so-called black people versus so-called white people, Asians versus Arabs or, or whoever. But it's going to be nation against nation. It says in kingdom against kingdom. And we definitely see that. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So we know that we have experienced the beginning of sorrows. So this is part one of the timeline. So, brother, go, go ahead and grab verses 9 through 14. It's the book of Matthew, chapter 24, starting at verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Come, come. So verse 9 says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye sh shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So we know right now, you know, nobody's being delivered up that's uh, claiming, you know, that we are the Israelites and that serve Yahweh. But we definitely see the second part of verse nine happening right now. Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. It's people that hate to hear us claim our identity. And they, they call us uh, BHIs, Black Hebrew is Israelites, or they call us identity extremists. And, you know, they, they make it as if we're doing some type of injustice or some crime for embracing our culture and actually realizing who we are and want, wanting to follow our God. So we definitely see that happening. And it says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. With Salaki, let me go back up to verse 10. It says, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. We definitely see that happening. But, you know, in this sense, you know, we will see this also in the truth. We will see someone that's supposed to be a brother, someone that's supposed to be a sister doing these things to us, betraying us. And may actually deliver you up to authorities or something when it comes to that time. You never know because, you know, we have to be refined through this fire. But some people, some people ain't genuine. Some people ain't real gold. So the fake gold going to get tarnished when the fire come. So we have to be prepared for those things. And it said, you know, they shall hate one another. And we know that, you know, someone hating you, it ain't just, um, I don't like that person. Showing hate for a person is just showing the opposite of what we know love is. We're proving each other or certain actions that we do to show each other that we love each other. So it says in verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And that's already happening. It's people walking around here saying that they the Messiah right now. That's supposed to be in this truth. And, you know, it's a sad thing because it ain't it ain't over. It ain't done. It's going to continue to happen and it's going to get worse. I think it's even a, a, a Jewish man or a white man over in uh, another country that's saying he's the Messiah also. So that's going to continue to happen. And it says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So, you know, we know iniquity is sin. And the people, our people, especially because they have no love for God and they're so deep in sin, they're very cold toward each other. Every day, you if you want to do a test and say, okay, let me see how many of our people are going to kill each other every day for about a month. Somebody definitely going to die every day in the United States. Uh, it's going to be black on black. 
is no way around it because that's just in our people's heart to do because they live for sin. So sin leads them to do things like murder each other and hate each other. So it says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So people walk around and say they saved, but all this stuff we just got through reading, showing that we got to go through all this stuff and actually endure it to actually be saved. And some of this stuff we ain't experienced yet. So we got a, we got a ways to go and it's going to get worse. So verse 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The whole world know about Christianity. It ain't a country you can go. And they don't know about white Jesus. So it definitely wasn't talking about that. But anywhere you go in this world, in a country that has people that have been placed there through transatlantic slave slave trade, don't know that Yahweh is their father. Don't know that they are actually Israelites. And they not that byword and that name that they've been given by their oppressor. So this hasn't happened, but it has to happen first. And it's happening. It's starting to happen. It's starting to spread. The news is spreading. And that's why you got certain people that Yahweh has used that may not actually be all the way in the truth, but they end up on the news like Kanye talking about us being the Israelites. Like Kyrie, it's all by design from the father because certain things have to happen to actually get this word and this message out to wake our people up. So, uh, brother, if you could grab verses 21 and 22. Verse 21 and 22. It's the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation as such was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Uh, so it's going to get real, real bad. And if Yahweh wasn't going to step in and stop it, we'll all be destroyed and killed. So his mercy is just something else that, you know, we have to be very thankful for that he's preserved us or wants to preserve us if we follow him and follow his commandments. Brother, uh, grab 23 verses 23 through 27. If I may, I had a precept. Con, go ahead. Con, just um, a harp on the point in, uh, in 21 and 22. Um, where it said um, it'll be great tribulation and basically it, there's been no great tribulation as great as this since the beginning of, of time. Um, this is Jeremiah 30 and 7. It says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Right, so just speaking to like... <laughs> You know the point of um, you know how how the brother Herb has been speaking to it, and then also what we what we're reading in Matthew twenty four, um, the Most High's elect, you know they 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 may have to go through some of these things, but the Most High is gonna bring them out of you know these trials and tribulations that that are gonna be that are being bestowed on, upon them, and that's gonna be bestowed upon them in the future. But uh, but uh, um, would you want me to read? Uh, verses twenty four. No, 23 through 27, but I'm going to make a point because you kind of uh, uh, made something come to my mind. So just like it says um, that this tribulation hasn't been seen before. And, you know, whatever this tribulation is, is going to be worse than anything we've ever experienced, any of our ancestors. And we know that our ancestors went through slavery. And when you, you look at the pictures and, you know, the depictions in movies, they went through a lot. But we might 
actually have to go through more. And we're actually going to have to go through worse as a people. May not be individually. You may not get beat down. But as a people, we're going to go through worse than what happened to our ancestors in slavery. There's just something to think about. So, you know, mentally, we have to be prepared. This ain't going to be no easy walk. Oh, yeah, brother. Go ahead. Grab that. 23 through 27. Car, car. Mr. Book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is the anointed, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false anointed and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. God. So just like we were talking about these false prophets and people claiming to be the Messiah, you know, we, we're not going to be swayed by those things because just like verse 27 says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We see these things that have to happen. So with this timeline we have, we know when Yahweh Shai is going to come back. And we also know that when he comes back, he coming with fire. Ain't no coming back, walking around on this earth like a mortal man and come out, love everybody and want peace. That ain't the Yahweh Shai that's coming back. He coming back to destroy some stuff. At the same time, saving his people. So, you know, that's how we definitely will know the difference between those false prophets and those that saying that they Christ and they not. Um, brother, go ahead. Grab verses 28 through 33. So book of Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put of leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, Know that it is near, even at the doors. Time. So it says, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So we know that, you know, an eagle eats and, you know, it's going wherever the food is at. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Now, this is not talking about the sun going to actually turn black and not give light. It's not talking about the moon not giving light. It's speaking of rulerships, governments. Uh, we know that the sun, it gives light to the day. It, it allows you to do whatever you need to do. You can see. Same thing with the moon. It gives you a little moonlight. You can see a little bit. Without this sun and this moon, which would be these governments having the certain things that they have to keep it operating is going to fail and he's going to make sure it fails. So he's going to take whatever necessities they have, 
or whatever resources they have away from them so that they crash and burn them. And so it says, and the stars shall fall from heaven. It's not talking about the regular, normal stars in the sky. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, this is this is showing exactly what I said about the government, the powers of the heavens. Heavens, not talking about the literal heavens like you, you think, you know, look up in the sky. Heavens, the rulership. And so the stars are the people who are in rulership. And we're going to get some scriptures to, to show and prove that. Brother, first get stars in the Greek and just read the Strong's definition. So the definition is a star as strewn over the sky, literally or figuratively. Time. So what I'm saying now is that this scripture is not a literal scripture talking about stars. It's figurative. And we're going to see why it's figurative. Brother, grab Revelation 22 verses, verse 16. It's the book of Revelation, chapter 22, and verse 16. I, yeah, I wish I have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Ah, and grab Revelation 1 and 20. It's the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Con. So we see that stars are used to identify people or angels, and we know that angels don't always mean spiritual angels brother devon i think went into that about a month ago about um the angels and how you know people think that angels ha had sex with humans and we went to multiple scriptures to show that angels can also mean a person or a messenger of god that's the actual definition messenger of god um brother if you could grab first corinthians chapter 15 Verses 51 through 55. It's the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be ri shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on corruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Time. So verse 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which means we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Now this is talking about when Yahweh Shai returns, just like we read that we would be caught up into the sky, into the cloud, which is which are the chariots. It says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, like we discussed earlier, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Just like we also read earlier. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So we're going to actually do away with this physical body that we have, and we'll receive our spiritual body and our spiritual crown. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So we know that's signifying that death is thrown into the lake of fire. Fire, that's the second death. And so, um, brother, if you could grab Zephaniah 1, verses 14 and 15. This book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, starting at verse 10. And it shall come to pass 14 in that day. Like 14 and 15. Con, con so like verse 14. The great day of Yahweh is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of Yahweh. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress. A day of wastedness. In, the, in desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Ah, just showing that this day is just not going to be pleasant for everybody. But these things we just read, that won't be something that's going to affect us. We're going to be caught up as long as we're doing the will of God and keeping his commandments. Um, Brother, I got one more scripture, which is Luke 17, verses 28 through 30. Twenty-seven through thirty. Twenty-eight through thirty. Twenty-eight. Con. Luke seventeen twenty-eight. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Time. And so we see it today. You know, we, we're doing our best, putting our best foot forward, keeping these commandments. A lot of our people don't care nothing about what Yahweh told them to do. And so it's the same as it was with Noah, and it's the same as it was with Lot. Everybody just going along with their daily life. And just living it up as if nothing's going to happen. But we know that these things are going to come to pass and we can be encouraged through the spirit and through the father's word that we're going to be preserved when all this, these things do happen to come, when this destruction does come upon this earth. So that's pretty much what I got. If any brothers want to add anything, you can.
Let me bring my screen in a little bit. It says, Hear, O ye my beloved, saith the Lord, Behold, days of trouble are at hand. I will deliver you from the same. Be ye not afraid, neither doubt, for God is your God. And the God of them who keep my commandments and precepts, saith the Lord God. Let not your sins weigh you down, and let not your iniquities lift up themselves. So, you know, just speaking to what the brother Hurt said, you know, we, we definitely, you know, it behooves us to, to be able to receive the signs, really the signs of the times. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, our best shot at being preserved is doing the will of the Most High God, which is keeping the commandments, right? And as it said in the scripture, um, the Most High is a God and a protector of them that keep his commandments. And I'm going to read this one last scripture. Um, this is uh, 1 Thessalonians. I believe it's 1 Thessalonians 1. I want to read it in the NLT real quick. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10 in the NLT. And um, contextually speaking, this is the Apostle Paul. He's speaking to the Israelites in Thessalonica, and he's commending them on repenting, right, for repenting from sins. Um, they fully came into the truth, and they've been washed, so to speak. Uh, this is verse 10 in the NLT. It says, And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Yahushai, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. So, like, you have, like, scriptures that talk about, you know, the day of the Lord and how to went off was it's going to be for a lot of people. But when you read in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10, it's giving an account of the Israelites in Thessalonica looking forward to Yahweh Shai coming back because they, they understand that that's their rescue. That's their salvation. And if you're, you know, walking in the truth and walking orderly, keeping the commandments, doing the will of the most high God and maintaining your faith, you know, this could be you. You know, you'll be looking forward, you know, to Yahweh Shai coming back, which is our salvation. But, um, you know, but that's, that's pretty much everything I got out. Uh, uh, I'll pray this. And, um, just a point, just off of what, what you just read, um, like a lot of the stuff that happened in the world, people may, you know, that may be an anxiety. They may have anxiety by certain stuff going on. Like, oh my God, it's getting so bad. People so, why they do this? Why they do that? I, I don't be feeling like they be feeling. I be kind of just like waiting on what's next. And like when I hear about a war, or something about to pop off, I, I, I'd be all oh, praises. Because I know what, you know, the Bible teaches about certain things happening, certain wars, certain countries doing certain things to actually make this thing come to pass. So, you know, it's going to be people that, you know, they're not going to like to see these events start to unfold. But, but us, we should be joyous. Regardless of what it looks like on a on the world view, in a carnal, in a carnal view of things, we should be happy because we should be thinking spiritually the whole time. Like, yeah, I was speeding this thing up, and you know, through the spirit, I know I'm gonna be preserved when this thing actually turns bad. So the worse it gets, we should be happy. We should be joined in this tribulation, overjoined in this tribulation. But but that's all I got. Um, if, if any other brothers got any points or anybody got any comments, Con Con also also meant to say, uh, you know, definitely beautiful lesson. All praise to the Most High. Con all praises, the water for the reading too. Con of course. And if nobody has anything, we'll close it out. Con, con, if all are clear, we're going to close it out with number six. Um, yeah, I will bless thee and keep thee. 
Yah will make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yah will lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And with that, I'll say Shalom.